forward on this computer. Fantastic. Um, who's who's monitoring the chat? I am. It's Jean. Thanks, Jean. Okie dokie then. We'll go ahead and get started. Um, so I want to say thank you all for being here. Um, if you post questions into the chat, um, Jean will be here to read them out loud because I, as happened in the last lecture, I unfortunately don't see them as I'm writing. Um, I am going to stop occasionally because people are in the waiting room and I'm letting them in. Um, if anything's unclear, if anything, if for some reason you can't read my handwriting, um, please feel free to interrupt. I mean, this is very informal. Um, obviously, we do kind of want to stay on topic, but um, I'd like this to be much more of a conversation and less of me uh, just talking at you guys. Audio. Hello. Hello. Hi. Just thought I'd stop by. I'll stop the video though, so you don't get distracted by my pretty face. <laughs> Um, Julia's here. I have some also some people who I did math with back in college. Um, so there's a really, really wonderful group of people. Hello. Here. Hi. I'm really delighted. All right. <clears throat> Introduction to logic. So some of you, um, I don't know if you know me at all, so I guess I'll do um, a brief introduction. My name is Marissa. Um, I did math at Berkeley and I did some courses in logic, and I'm right now trying to finish up my master's degree in mathematical logic from a university in Paris. Um, I really like logic, specifically mathematical logic. I'm really excited to be talking. Um, yeah, and I guess, I don't know what kind of logic you signed up for or what kind of logic you were interested in, so first, I thought we'd at least have a conversation about uh, the scope of this lecture series, or at least what I hope we end up covering. Um, that way, everybody's clear about what the expectations are. Um, and again, if, if you have questions, I mean, please, please feel free to jump in or post them in the chat, and Jean will read them out loud. So first, <clears throat> um, I wanted to break the topic of logic into three different sections, informal, philosophical, and mathematical logic. Um, Informal logic, I'm going to say, is um, I mean, we've always had a need since basically communication has ever been a thing. Um, we've always had a need to delineate between good arguments and bad arguments. So whether or not an argument is actually good can convince other people. That's kind of what's been important in all of history. Um, so this is, let me just erase. Fantastic. Good and, bad are, good and bad arguments. This is the kind of logic that dude bros seem to champion, you know, when they're on the internet and they're like, eh, the SJWs and they don't understand logic. This is what they're talking about. They don't actually know anything about philosophical logic or mathematical logic. Um, they're really just <laughs> Thank you, Jean, for laughing. <laughs> and this is the kind of, like, I'd say informal logic is the kind of courthouse logic, courthose. Courthouse logic, um, not that you, not that it's very formal or very rigorous. Um, you're just trying to convince other people. And if you learned how to, if you wanted to come to this lecture to learn how to like argue better, that's unfortunately not at all what this is going to be useful for. It's not um, rhetoric. <laughs> it's not like, rhetoric. Yeah, I mean, like I, like when people say it's common, that's not logic. I hate when people, but. Um, no kidding. Sorry? Yeah, I think like that would fall into informal logic is like common sense or like everyone knows such and such thing, right? Mm -hmm. Common sense. That's a good one. Um, so philosophical logic. Um, actually, Julia, please, 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 please. I know. So Julia is actually doing a master's in philosophy um, was very, very knowledgeable about this topic, but I would say philosophical logic is concerned with much more with abstract notions about like the nature of why things are true or how things are true or how we, how we actually consider mathematical objects. 
um, a lot of questions about like, what is the purpose of methodical logic? Like, what is the scope of mathematical logic? How does logic relate to natural language and how we communicate with one another? What does it mean to mean something? What? what does it mean to mean something? <laughs> <laughs> That's a what is meaning? Um, oh, oh, uh, there's a famous quote from Wittgenstein who, uh, Julia, I'll let you say it, about what a point is. Oh, a point in space is an argument place. <sighs> I have no idea. It makes sense, actually. I forgot why it makes sense, but it does make sense. <laughs> like, once you, once you unpack all the definitions, uh, yeah, he was right. A point in space is an argument place. I don't know what that means. It sounds fascinating. <laughs> Also not what we're going to be talking about in the scope of this lecture. I think that philosophical logic and mathematical logic do um, come together often, especially the further you get into mathematical logic. Oh. Um, but philo philosophical logic is like a whole other topic in its own right that um, I want to just say like I respect, but I don't know enough about to talk about. Um, maybe I can pull Julia's arm and convince her to give us a lecture. Uh, but yeah, um, but but also just like um, a, a, a tangent, but like there are like algebraic methods. So people are using methods of mathematics in philosophical logic. Like they're taking techniques from like algebra and stuff and putting it into philosophical logic. I had a book from the library before the before the quarantine. Um, but but it's a whole book. So so yes, you're very right. It's a huge thing. Or like philosophical logic and mathematical logic are separate. Um, yeah, and it's it's a whole other uh, a ballpark, maybe, I don't know, so. Yeah, whole other, uh, whole other can of suitcases. Oh. Uh, the worms, you know. It's a whole other thing. Does somebody raise a hand? Go ahead. Do that. That's me. Hi. Hello. Hi. Um, yeah, uh, so just like a comment question, I guess. It seems like both informal logic and philosophical logic are kind of, I don't want to say language based, but it seems to be talking about like the meanings of words or the meanings of, of language statements. I don't want to say English language statements, but spoken statements. I don't know if that's right. So I think um, I think I can put to words what you're getting at is um, philosophical logic and informal logic are a lot more connected to um, like human behavior in real life. I mean, is that close uh, to what you're getting at? Yeah, I think I think that's part of it. I, I don't know. Some for some reason in my mind, I was thinking about the difference between. Uh, like asking the meaning of a word and asking the meaning of something in math. And those feel like, those feel like different things. Mm. They're very similar, I would say. Mm. Travis in the chat uh, suggested that maybe the, the distinction we're making here is um, applied logic versus pure logic. Ooh. I think that might be another dimension of, of what we're getting sure. at. Yeah. Yeah, there are many, many different levels analytic versus versus synthetic mm -hmm. um to where like notion like things in logic and where they coincide with real life where they coincide with definitions that we use day to day versus just purely mathematical definition um and my hope is that kind of throughout this talk i will um give you the foundation of how we define things strictly mathematically from the ground up um, completely separate from like, quote unquote, real life or like definitions that we use day to day. Um, so hopefully the distinction will become more clear. Um, in terms about the history of mathematical logic, um, mathematical logic was initially founded um, with the goal of understanding different mathematical structures. They decided, let's give, let's study the structure of mathematics and see if there are techniques that we can use to prove things in other fields. It actually proved incredibly fruitful. I mean, there are a lot of different applications to mathematical logic. Um, functional analysis, which I would just say is calculus on steroids. Um, number theory, which is like the super crazy field, but I would categorize it as um, think about like prime numbers and questions like the twin prime theorem. Um, 
for Ma's last theorem, but then like even more complicated. I mean, number theory, gross. No, thank you. And there's some fantastic applications in computer science, um, like calculability, um, the halting problem as an example of a subject in calculability, uh, graph theory, super useful in computer science, um, all of which fall under the subset of logic. Um, but what we're more concerned about is um, logic as a separate mathematical field kind of without the need for application to justify its study, kind of um, defining it on its own as a subject in its own right. So while logic does have some really fantastic applications, um, they, they do come up like I'll mention them. But again, this is, we're kind of trying to dive in here to just like the purest form of mathematical logic, completely separate from anything that might be useful in real life. Um, if you hear that and you want to leave this lecture, I do not judge you at all. <laughs> um, Bode added, I think in the, um, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right, um, but the, in the like uses of logic, the study of integers, I think more number theory. Oh yeah, yes. That would definitely, um, at least to my knowledge, fall into the scope of number theory. Um, Can I say a comment? Yeah. Um, it's interesting because uh, I, I think like logic sort of developed like first, I mean like first like mathematics sort of developed at, because it was useful in the real world. Because, I mean, like we're going way, way back into history, like, but because people needed to use it for the real world. And then over time like as we use these like same things over and over like we you know we'd start to do science and like take measurements and realize patterns and things and like there is like a, a harmony that's going on and then we decide to try and like formulize these things um but uh so and then and and then logic like it's it sort of like became its own thing like it's it's this like underlying like structure like it's the rules of how we think and so it has a sort of universality that like we've had to come to sort of by like wandering through this dark tunnel um we're like huh there's something behind this is there maybe i don't know open question but uh so i would say that yeah it's a, it's a little bit of both and then so we're just looking at like abstracted from all the applications that logic does have in real world things yeah. Thanks. Solid. Um, okay. So as we go through the, um, as we start, there's some foundations of mathematical logic, but the four different main fields, I mean, there's so many sub ones, the four different ones that I'm currently studying, um, set theory, model theory, calculability, I'm going to write slash complexity, uh, and proof theory. And they all have their different they all have their different styles, their different uses. They, they're very interconnected with one another. Um, and we'll definitely end up hopefully talking about each one. But in the meantime, I do want to kind of give you this analogy that I have between um, mathematical logic as a language and the natural languages that we use day to day. Because when we're considering like mathematical sentences, um, we're, we're trying to literally like rock bottom, like what is how do you express a mathematical idea? So in the most rigorous way, um, it's unfortunate because you can pick up a logic textbook and it'll say like, oh, like a signature, you have an alphabet, you have strings. And I remember just being flooded with, oh my God, I have no idea what we're talking about or why this is nothing close to what I thought I was going to be learning. Um, so hopefully this analogy helps illuminate that a little bit. So we can consider mathematical logic like a natural language. Um, in fact, I think that there's a lot of that in philosophy. Um, these fields are united by uh, linguistics. So in um, English, again, any natural language, um, you can consider the alphabet, you know, A, B, C. And just for purposes of the metaphor, I'm going to include grammatical um, word punctuation literally forgetting normal words now. Um, I'm going to include these symbols. I know they're not technically part of our quote unquote alphabet, um, but just for the sake of the metaphor, it'll make more sense. Whereas in mathematical logic, 
our alphabet is um, we're going to use A, B, and C as propositions. Literally just like an idea. X is an integer, or no, two is an integer. Um, infinity exists. You can think of um, these propositions as, as abstracting away everything and just saying, here's a mathematical, uh, literally a proposition. Like if I proposition you something like if A were true, um, and these usually have either, we boil it down to this is either a true proposition or a false proposition, um, and there are no other alternatives. So other than propositions, we also have um, connectives between them. So um, I don't know, maybe you guys are all familiar with this. Um, I think I see some bubbles coming up in the chat. Yeah, uh, uh, Leah w was asking um, what you mean by natural languages, um, and Bode added that uh, they think uh, you mean like other human languages. Is that about right? Ooh, yes. So I do mean other human languages. That being said, um, this could of course correspond to, uh, I mean like binary. Like basically anything that you could classify as a language, as a means of communicating ideas from one being to another. Um, but initially, yeah, I mean, I mean natural as in like human, human used, human made, Okay. They're all human made. Huh? Aren't they all human made? Even like logic languages? Well, that's a question of if you believe in God. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's something related. That's philosophy. Some, some kind of intelligent being, you know. Um, okay. So our connectives and or implies by implication and not. And just like in the natural languages that we use, we can combine our alphabet into different words, different strings, different lists of characters in our alphabet to hopefully mean something. So I think that the examples that I had, um, like lip gloss, Rush Limbaugh, um, and this one, I'm just going to put a bunch of like nonsense because, because technically via our definition, this is a word. It's a string of characters from our alphabet. And just as we can create words with the natural language, we can create words with our mathematical language um, propositions. We can begin to describe the idea of an implication as A implies B. Um, I don't want to get too bogged down in the natural languages, but we had another question in the chat. Um, do natural languages evolve over time, quote, naturally? Uh, do non-natural languages evolve? I'm not sure we said anything about there being languages that are non-natural. Not sure Ooh. what that would mean. I would call into question, like, what do we consider a natural language versus a non-natural language? So, Jean, I think you hit it right on the money. Um, I guess, I guess if you were to consider mathematical logic as a non-natural language, um, cause people don't necessarily like speak it to one another, um, you could say it evolves in its own way. You know, I think that this is a really interesting topic, um, but I am going to try to continue with the metaphor and then maybe we can talk about this during discussion on Wednesday. Um, but I'll make sure to make a note of that so I can bring it up. Thank you. All right. So, um, the words we're going to have are things like A, implies B, um, not C, and D. Not, not C and D. Um, and then another, I'm going to throw in a nonsense word here as well. Um, so we have these words and in English, natural language, we have a grammar, which tells us how we can construct words, what's considered a valid word. So if I said the word, or I guess the pair of words, lip gloss, I'm communicating an idea to you. Um, whereas whatever this is, we have no idea. And it's because it's outside of what our grammar defines. 
So I would say grammar is the rules that we use to form sentences, or to form words and sentences from chunks of words. Um, and similarly, our mathematical grammar says um, that this is nonsense, that there are some rules for how you can combine the connectives and the propositions to say like, okay, if you're going to use the proposition and you need to, or if you're gonna use the connective and you need a proposition on one side and you need another proposition on the other side. Um, this, oh, no, ah, everything's exploding. Wow, okay. Can everybody see my screen or no? I don't see a screen share right now. Fantastic. My, uh, my computer freaks out occasionally, which is really unfortunate. Same. Like you freak out occasionally? Yes. <laughs> you, weren't, you weren't referring to the, your computer freaking out occasionally? No. <laughs> Let me get back to Zoom. I never freak out. Ever about anything? Nope. Wow. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so that's an example of a uh, proposition that's false. <laughs> Sorry to call you out. Uh, in <laughs> which uh, verse? <laughs> All right. Can you see my screen? Yes. Indeed. Fantastic. All right. Rules that we use to form words and sentences. Uh, the grammar that we have for mathematics, if you have an implication symbol, you need two propositions on either side. Um, a not goes in front of a proposition. There are some kind of basic rules for how to put together these. I mean, we can have really, 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 really long propositions that just get really, really silly with more and more um, variables. And I guess if your logic teacher really, really hated you, they could give you something like this and ask you to give it a truth table, which I'll give um, an example. Vogue suggested we add parentheses to the alphabets. Oh, yes, yes. Parentheses are certainly included in the alphabet. Um, thank you, Bode. As uh, distinguishing between two different expressions or multiple, multiple expressions, because it's, as I said here, not C and D is different from not. Cool. Morgan. So there's the question um, in real life of the structure of a sentence versus the meaning of a sentence. So just because I can say a sentence out loud, um, and even though it's grammatically sound, it doesn't mean that it actually is understandable or I'm actually trying to communicate something. So I think the example I had for this one uh, was lip gloss filibusters and you. Grammatically correct, um, absolute nonsense, unless you're talking about um, like a lipstick feminist empowerment book for women going into Congress. Um, under any other circumstances, that's complete nonsense. So an example that I really, really like is this bagel. I don't know if you guys have seen this picture on the internet. Um, uh, is this a sandwich? I'd really, I'd really love answers here. I'm actually have been thinking about this quite a bit. Is this a sandwich? Um, and this, this is like a topology question, isn't it? Like, is this a hole? Is this a sandwich? It's like a hole. C can you continuously deform it? Is that how you it? define sandwiches? Is something? I, I don't know. I don't know. But maybe. It's a starting point. It, de it depends if it rests like a continuous surface after you put in the peanut butter and jelly. Oh my god. But like if you have two separate pieces of bread <laughs> that are separated by the jelly, like that's not a continuous Then it's a sandwich. Surface. Yeah. So is it like being separated by another substance with like bread on that, it? That's the thing. It, is it continuously like, and like I would say no, the bread isn't still, is it, is it, is it isn't a continuous surface. So we have some sandwich comments in the chat. Um, Ooh, let's hear it. says it depends on how you define a sandwich, which fair. Um, Julia says it's not. No. God said not. 
Um, and Travis says the contents of a sandwich must be path connected. So yeah, I, I think we're getting into like some topology. Uh, I don't um, agree with that though. Ooh, ooh, another topic well, for the discussion. I mean, yeah, if you I think we just started a fight. Your sandwich, like, then they're not going to be path connected. Your lettuce is not connected to your kale. <laughs> All right. Um, and then we have a longer um, concern about natural languages, um, which do we want to get into now or save that for a discussion? Oh, let's save that for a discussion because uh, I think you said that it was Bode who said it depends on how you define a sandwich. Um, and that's exactly the point. Um, is it, it depends. It all depends in the language that we use day to day. Uh, depends on how you define things. So mathematically, that's why we go through so much work to define our alphabet and our words and our grammar so that there is absolutely no ambiguity. All of the definitions are clear cut, very concise. Um, and that's why we're going through all of this really difficult work. Um, so what I've begun to describe to you with the propositions, the connectives, and the grammar um, is propositional calculus. Which, because um, you can look at propositional calculus and you'd be like, okay, if you literally just have A, B implications and knots, you're not actually talking about um, functions or objects or relationships between mathematical objects. And that's, that's right, because we haven't actually gotten there yet. Um, on top of propositional calculus, we add predicate calculus, um, which includes functions, constants, and relations, and which will help. With predicate calculus, we'll be able to define all of mathematics, or at least all the mathematics that we want to. So I'm going to get more into these in a bit. Um, we're almost done with our linguistics analogy. Um, the only thing that mathematical logic also has is an axiomatic system. And by this, I'm going to say it's a theory. So a theory is a list of axioms um, The one that mathematicians use the most is ZF, Zermelo Franco. Yeah. Uh, two different. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, Axiom, I mean a statement which need not be proved. Um, nah. That everybody kind of agrees upon um, is true. Like we're, we're accepting that these things are true all, as all like a mathematical community. And we're going to use these statements, these axioms, um, in order to build up our, our theory, our, what we can prove with them. Statement that need not be proved. Julia, do you have a comment on axioms? Axioms, um, yeah, the axiomatic system. Um, I was thinking of doing a lecture on this, so maybe uh, save for later. But um, like, uh, it, it didn't like just the sky that we're like, yeah, we're gonna like think of all these different theories and like then like uh, a system where we don't have to prove these things. But like, it goes way back down to like Euclid and his use of like postulates and axioms and stuff. And yes, just things that like we take to be true and like they don't have proofs and everything. Um, so, uh, yeah, axiomatic systems, very important. Yes. yes. To be true. I would love to show you the, um, kind of compact list of the axioms that are included in ZF. Unfortunately, uh, one, it's infinite. Um, two, it requires, um, an understanding of set theory, which, um, I'll get into in a separate lecture. Um, I will get back more to some of the, um, quote unquote simpler axioms after we talk about propositional and predicate calculus. Um, but for now, we're, we're starting with, okay, we're going to have a theory, we're going to have a foundation of axioms, and we're going to build up from there using propositional and predicate calculus. Um, lastly, inference rules. Um, this is how you formally construction of proofs. Um, Bode had a question about the um, ZF axioms. Um, they said it's infinite. Isn't it like nine axioms? One of um, them. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, one of them, or I think two of them, maybe, but I know definitely one of them. The axiom is actually a schema of axioms. So it's a whole, it's like for every formula, but we can't quantify over formulas or like we break everything. So we 
it's it's a schema of axioms that you can like we can say that it's it's the schema of axioms, but it's not one axiom. Um, so we can write it out with our hands, but uh, but it's not finitely axiomatizable. Remember that. Right. Um, and Lee asked, can someone define schema? So schema, um, I would say is the formal statement is that something that the statement is true and the statement requires set theory, but this statement is true for every formula. So what it means is every time you plug in a formula into this kind of, um, imagine it like a, like a function, like it has an input. So like there's this blank, there's this blank axiom that says, uh, put a formula in here, it's true for this formula. And it's true for every formula that you could come up with. Um, I know that that's a little ambiguous right now, but imagine it as um, there's infinitely many logical formulas that one can create. Um, anytime you have a formula, you could plug it into this format and get a new statement. Which is why ZF is infinite. Uh, Bode said like a blueprint and Nicholas said uh, like a template. Yes, blueprint, template, I like both. Cool. The formula in the meta language. Yes, oof, oof, meta language. Yeah, meta languages. Lovely, all right. So we'll talk more about how we actually construct proofs once we talk about propositional and predicate calculus. So in propositional calculus, again, we're only working with propositions, connectives, parentheses. We have valid statements and invalid ones as per our grammar. We're obviously only going to concern ourselves with the valid ones. This one is read A implies B implies B implies A. And something that we do when we consider statements, formulas in propositional calculus is we say, under which conditions is this statement true? Because it's not true under all conditions, right? It's possible to have something imply a second thing, but not the second thing to imply the first. If there are clouds outside, it doesn't mean that it's raining. But if it's raining, there are indeed clouds outside. Um, is this true? So semantically, and by semantically, I mean giving meaning to something, we're going to assign Boolean values, so truth values, for every proposition. We're going to say this one is true, this one is false. If this one is false, and this one is true, and so on. So an example of this, um, I've made a truth table for this formula. So this is A implies B or B implies A. When is this formula true? So if we assign the values true and false to A and B, we get four different options, right? We say, okay, what happens when A is true and B is false? Well, for implications, a statement of an implication is true, is true almost under all circumstances, except not true when A is true and B is false. So semantically, if A is true, B necessarily has to follow. Otherwise, this statement is false. So if A is true and B is false, this is false. If you have a false statement, you can always imply whatever you want. Um, that's called vacuous truth. If you haven't seen it before, it is a little bizarre to think about like, what? But think about it. if the universe is literally broken, if zero, if zero equals one, um, then anything you possibly want could be true. Uh, we can talk more about that in the discussion. Vacuous truth is really um, interesting, especially as you're being introduced to logic. But for now, just filling out this truth table, uh, if B is false, then this is true. Um, and this or symbol means as long as we have this is true or this is true, then this whole statement is true. And in this case, yes, we do have that this statement is true. Um, so filling this out really quick, 
if A is false and B is true, that's fine. If B is false, if B is true and A is false, that's false. We do still have a true statement, and these are both true, because false always implies whatever you want. So fantastic. We filled out a truth table, and because every assignment that we gave, every truth assignment, meaning we are said either A was true, we gave A truth or falsehood, B truth or falsehood, and then examined what happened under those circumstances, um, which is called a truth assignment, meant, uh, leads to the entire statement, this one, A implies B or B implies A being true. So that's not always true. Like in this case, there are some assignments of B and A under which the circumstances would dictate that this statement is not true. When we have this, where every assignment is true, this is called a tautology. So a question that just, um, I think, got answered in the chat. Uh, does A implies B mean B is true whenever A is true? I think that, that is what's going on, right? Sorry, could you say that again? Does A implies B mean B is true whenever A is true? Um, no, A could be false and B could still be true. Because again, yeah. if you start with a false premise, you can, you automatically get for free whatever you want after the implication. Right, but like A, A being true means B is true necessarily. Yes. Where A being false doesn't say anything about B. Yes, exactly. Okay. I think there is a confusion between the meta language and the actual mathematic uh, mathematical formal language. I mean, in, in, when, when we state a theorem about something in calculus or in number theory, etc., when we say something implies something, we usually assume that A is, is true. Um, I'm not. I'm not sure that that's always been the case. I mean, I guess for an introductory logic course, we at least want to go through um, having people understand what it means when you start with a false assumption. But um, yeah, I suppose as we continue on through mathematical logic, we'll always be assuming that our, our assumptions will always be true. Because otherwise, otherwise, what are we talking about? Right? Um, right. And I think that um, you bring up a really good point. There's a difference between meta language Ooh, getting real deep here. Meta language and the language itself. So the language is, is this stuff, is the alphabet, the words, the grammar, all of these things I'm telling you. The meta language is us talking about it, which is, which is somewhat different and it's difficult to parse through when we're using the same words, but in kind of two different meanings. Um, so we do have to be very, very careful. So I do appreciate you guys calling out questions like this and clarifying, I think is, is really, really healthy. Um, you can do a lot with propositional calculus. There are a lot of many different theorems that follow. Um, I think in a lot of introductory logic courses, they have you do several different truth tables or trying to, um, play with and like manipulate things like De Morgan's laws, um, in order to show that you understand how the connectives work. Um, we're not going to go through those. I can, I guess, assign exercises if people would find that helpful. Um, but for now, we're going to conclude our talk about propositional calculus and now uh, switch over to predicate calculus. So before we switch over to predicate calculus, I'd like uh, to make space if anybody has questions about propositional calculus. Uh, yeah, question. So is is the truth table like the definition of implies or are we getting the definition of implies from somewhere else and then using that to build the truth table um we're getting the definition of implies from somewhere else namely when we define our alphabet up here i'm sorry that i didn't include the definition up here um, but we define that separately, and then we use the connectives in the truth table. I could, I could make a separate one just for 
A implies B. If this, if this is helpful, um, we could say, okay, um, true, false, false, true, 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 false, false. Right. If A is true and B is false, this is false. Uh, true, true, true. So here is a truth table for implication. Um, I don't know. So is, is there any, maybe what I'm trying to ask is, is there any information about implies that I wouldn't get from this truth table? Mm. Or, or do I know everything about implies just by looking at this truth table? Yeah, I would say so. I can't think of anything that you would need to know about implication that isn't coded into this into this truth table. So I guess you could use this as a definition for implication. I think it tells you how the connective works, how it right. evaluates. Right. Okay. So, yeah. Great, thank you. Um, okay. There was also uh, Vasudha uh, brought up tautology. They said a tautology is when the statement is true for all truth assignments, right? Yes. Yeah. Leads to the statement being true. Fantastic. Okay. Um, so with that, moving on to predicate calculus. Um, predicate calculus is now where we add several different symbols. First, we are now allowed to work with functions. We're allowed to work with relations and constants. So by constants, I mean like you can use the symbols one and zero. Um, so relations, um, usually often like capital R, um, you could say, this is where we now throw in a quality because believe it or not in propositional calculus, we didn't actually have a quality. Um, we can have now the less than symbol. We can define these relations, um, and constants. I'm going to just say for now, uh, zero and one. Okay. So predicate calculus, um, also super, super rich, a lot more expressive. Um, I think that in my Friday talk, I may have sped through predicate calculus. So I guess I wanna go as carefully as possible. Um, another thing that we have is these symbols, which mean for all, and there exists. So using um, are zero and one meant to be truth values? Asked Travis. Ooh. Sometimes. Um, the thing about eventually what we're going to talk about model theory is you can define these to mean a lot of different things. So are they just symbols for now? Yes, they're just symbols for now um, that you can use kind of as placeholders. But symbols that like grammatically work in a certain way. Yes. Cool. Um, and Bode asked if all relations, all relations are binary. Correct. Okay, no, not, not all relations are binary. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, we can define a lot of different kinds of relations um, that have maybe um, one variable, six variables, 10 variables, um, infinitely many variables, I guess why not? Um, anyway, think about relations right now as a relationship between two objects. Okay. Or more. Yeah, or more. Um, and here, or fewer. Here's where we bring in um, sets, where I need to define sets, whereas I didn't do in the Friday lecture. Um, sets, I really like to introduce them as a mathematical bin. So um, if I show you X and I just say this is a variable, um, this is different than X. This bracket notation means the set containing X. Um, this is how we differentiate between objects and collections of objects. Um, there's a very famous Russell's paradox, which means that we can't use sets for everything. 
I do want to save that for later um, where I'm just defining that these are, these are like mathematical bins. Like imagine if you're trying to sort things in a warehouse and you're trying to say, okay, these things belong in this bin. They could also go in this bin. I'm going to put these two bins together. Um, I think that's essentially what I'm going to leave it at from now. Uh, and I know people are, people are really itching to talk about the axiom of choice and we will get there, but not for this lecture, unfortunately. So think about these as math. You're itching. I, you know what, Jean, call me out if you want. <laughs> but, we're not gonna, we're not gonna get there yet. Okay. So these mathematical bins mean, um, so some examples, actually, let's say we have the natural numbers. 0, 1, 2, so on. Don't talk to me if you think that 0 doesn't belong in the natural numbers. I'm not going to, I'm not going to bother. We're not going to go there. Uh, we have the symbol for the integers. So negative 3, so all the natural numbers, including integers. Um, and then we have, you know, rationals and real numbers and the complex numbers and so on. These are all different sets of numbers. They all have this kind of same We've, we've put them into different categories. So that means now with my for all and their exist symbols, I can um, say, okay, for all X in the set of integers. So now I'm, what I'm doing here is I'm quantifying over sets. So I'm saying for everything that's in this mathematical bin, this is now the power that predicate calculus gives us, whereas propositions only let us manipulate um, truth, falsehood, implication. Um, we can now talk, we can now actually talk about mathematical objects when we couldn't before. Okay. So an example here, um, for all X in Z, I'm gonna say there exists a Y in Z such that um, y, y is less than x. And now I have a statement in predicate calculus. Predicate calculus statement. I've, I've used the, the functions, the constants, these new quantifiers, as they're called, to build up a new sentence in my language. And now, semantically, I can decide, is this true or false? Now we're actually building the things that we're going to be using in logic to actually talk about numbers. Because yes, in, the, in integers, this is true. Every time I have an integer, I can always find a smaller integer. But if I change this, if I change the set that I'm quantifying over to say the natural numbers, this is no longer true because zero is the smallest natural number. I cannot find one that is strictly smaller. So, um, I'm just going to take now a moment to answer any questions about predicate calculus. Gene, do we have any action in the chat? Uh, no, but some folks are introducing themselves and it's wonderful. Oh, lovely. Uh, I have a question. All right, let's hear it. Why are we calling these calculuses? Like my understanding of calculus does not have to do with Boolean logic. Ooh, okay. Good cue. Yeah, why are these called calculus? Called calculuses. That is a very great question. Yeah, apostrophe, I don't have no idea how to write the plural calculi. Calculi. Aha. Uh -huh. um, calculi, lovely. Um, my understanding of this is that the root word here is calculate. So literally just to calculate something, to evaluate something. So I think that actually before calculus was calculus, i.e. finding the area underneath the curve or doing an integral or whatever, um, before it was used for that specific reason, it was used just to say, you're calculating something. So we're calculating statements with propositions and we're calculating statements with propositions and predicates. Um, when we talk more about proof theory, there's also different kinds of proof calculi, 
which are different ways of calculating, I mean, literally calculating proofs. So when you see the word calculus here, try to think of it as um, just a method for calculating something. I hope, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. We did get a question in the chat from Travis. They oh. asked, uh, what are we allowing to be members of sets right now? Like, have we established primitive objects? Ooh, okay, Travis. Oh man, oh, don't get me started. So there's a whole question of uh, what, what are we allowed to put on a set? And we're definitely going to talk more about this in set theory, where we will literally construct all of mathematics from the concept of nothing. Like literally the absence of something is where we construct numbers and everything else. Um, and it really gets really interesting philosophically. But for now, think about every mathematical object you can think of. You can put that in a set. Just think about, think about it that way for now, because we haven't actually constructed any objects yet. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, I feel like Travis might have some uh, connections to Bertrand Russell, because they just said set of all sets. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're, oh man, I have an itch to talk about paradoxes, and I have an itch to talk about the axiom of choice, and believe me, I really want to scratch it, but I don't want to get people too in over their heads. Yeah, one more before we move on. Bode suggested proper classes. Oh, man. So there's, there's a lot going on here. We'll get there. Y'all are peeking behind the curtain, and it's really cool. Yes, y'all are definitely peeking behind the curtain. We will get to all these wonderful topics. But for now, if this is your very first introduction to logic, we're going to the sets. Sets are our mathematical bins. Anything you can imagine, you can put in a set. And uh, don't look behind the curtain, pay no attention, uh, every, everything's fine. <laughs> okay. It's so not we... fine. Be very afraid. <laughs> Shh. Don't scare away. Don't scare them away. <laughs> um, I had a great analogy of how going into logic is like um, going into, uh, you know, the boat ride in Willy Wonka? Except instead of Gene Wilder, it's Bertrand Russell and Godel and uh, Alan Turing, this like three-headed dude, and you're like, there's colors and cockroaches flashing everywhere, and you're dizzy and nauseous, and there's, there's no earthly way of knowing which direction we are going. It's very, very fitting for how absolutely dizzying and overwhelming logic can be. Um, so if you're there, if you're feeling that, uh, then you're in the right place. If you're feeling nauseous, that's a normal feeling to have. Okay. Um, we can come back to this more later, but propositional There was one more predicate question um, oh, from here. Nicholas. Uh, if for all something is true, is there exists something always true? Um, yes. Yes. Well, it depends on if you're, if you're quantifying over the same set, but yes. Um, if uh -huh. Yeah, that's kind of what Travis got at as like they had an example where they started quantifying over something different. Yes, if for all things in a set are true, then there exists something with that quality in the set is also true. Uh, I'm sorry, I disagree. <clears throat> for example, if we said for all x and phi, p of x, any, any statement of x, this statement is always true, but there is a, there exists an x in phi such that something is always false, um, phi being the empty set. Okay, so sorry, so for all x in the empty set, um, p of x is always true, statement of. Okay. But when we say there exists an X in the empty set such that something, whatever P of X, uh -huh. this is always false. Oh, yeah, okay. Except for the empty set. Which, thanks for bringing it up, the empty set is the set of nothing, the set that contains nothing. 
It's literally defined as the set such that X does not equal itself. Um, and we'll be using the empty set to build up everything. That's what I meant by the concept of nothing earlier. Um, yes, thank you for calling me out on that. We have to be really careful about, um, we have to be really careful about what we say. This is logic. All right. So predicate calculus, we now have ways to talk about mathematical objects. Um, after we talk about set theory and model theory, it'll be a lot more clear how we literally construct these things. But for now, um, lastly, I did want to mention very briefly, um, I know, again, everybody wants to talk about the incompleteness theorems. Um, some of the axiomatic, some of the axioms in our theory, the theory of ZF, I wanted to mention because they're easy to put into um, just straight English so that you can kind of get an idea for what a theory is, what a system of axioms is. Um, so for the non-infinite ones, um, one of them that is sometimes included is uh, things exist. Sometimes people just literally take this for granted and, and, and don't bother to say, but um, things are real. We literally, we, we are working with actual mathematics here. We're not just pushing symbols around. Um, that's just existence. Um, another one is the, the concept of infinity. Infinity exists. There exists an infinite set, is the statement. Um, and believe it or not, some people, some mathematicians do not agree. <clears throat> and I mean, again, we can have, ooh, ooh, I love, I love talking, talking to me about some, some good infinities, but uh, we'll have to save that for later. Some mathematicians don't agree that infinity exists. It was one of our axioms. Uh, Bode asked, are these uh, folks who don't agree with there being infinite sets, uh, are they modern mathematicians? Um, some of them, yes. Some of them, yes. There are people, um, finitists. Um, yeah, I know, of, I know of one, I can't remember his name right now, but I know of one, I think, in University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, who's written several books, who's just a very, very um, strong finitist and... I've heard some of my professors laugh at him and then I actually read his stuff and I'm like, yeah, he's, <laughs> he's different. He's got a point, you know. Travis added, and not cranks. And <laughs> <laughs> like, are these just grumpy mathematicians <laughs> wanting to like stir things up? Well, that's all mathematicians are just grumpy and wanting, wanting to stir the pot, but that's neither here nor there. Um, know that these are actual people who have, um, different philosophical beliefs who believe mathematical objects are constructed differently or that some of the things that we do with them are unacceptable. Um, I mean, when we start talking about axiomatic systems and the things that we choose to accept, no, not everybody agrees on these things. I mean, I think that the majority of the mathematical community is fine with assuming ZF and going from there. I mean, they're much more concerned about things like, you know, differential equations and dynamical systems and, you know, whatever Terence Tao is turning out nowadays, which I'm sure is like super brilliant. Um, but then there's the, then there's the philosophers and the mathematical logicians who are squabbling over these things. So I don't, I don't want to give the impression that like, this is a super hotly debated topic. Um, but there are some people who disagree. Um, okay. So for number, for number three, the last example that I wanted to give, I didn't want to give a fourth one. The last example is uh, you can make the union of two sets. So if I have, x and if i have y i can construct x union y to get the set containing x and y Ooh, arnav asked is this infinity as an object or infinity as a concept this is infinity as an object this is infinity as a set an infinite set exists Oh, and Nicholas asked about this, um, like, you can take unions of set. What happens if x equals y is true? Um, well, then you just have x union x, which is also x. 
so the the difference here i think is that x and y are symbols that are assumed to be distinct and not like variables that change values yeah i mean even if even if they are hmm. or like they're not variables that are assumed to take the same value all the time right even if they even if they do take the same value you could just collapse I mean, you could technically take the union of X with itself, you know, to say countably infinitely many times just to be careful. Um, and you'll still just end up with the set containing X. I don't, I don't know of any, I don't know of any um, trouble you're causing in doing that. Okay. Yeah. So those are a few examples of axioms. It sounds like there are several of you who are from more familiar. Um, again, we'll get to set theory. So the goals, what we want from a theory, what we hope that our theory can do. Um, so expressiveness, and I'm going to say this by um, our theory can actually talk about things. Uh, Leah had a question. Uh, okay. When we're talking about that third axiom, why does this need to be an axiom? This feels provable from the other axioms. That's a very good point. There are um, axioms that are provable from some of the other ones. So um, technically the whole theory of ZF, uh, there's one called the axiom of foundation. And the axiom of infinity. And uh, what I've learned in my classes in set theory is that interesting things happen when you consider, okay, um, if, my, if my theory of ZF has um, eight axioms plus an axiom schema, I can ask what happens when I don't include axiom five. And let's just say, uh, for the sake of your question, Leah, that this is actually uh, the action, axiom of creating unions. What happens if I am not suddenly allowed to create unions? Well, um, the thing about a theory is it doesn't actually have to, not every axiom has to be independent of the other ones. So I can, I can get rid of this if I want, um, and I will be able to derive it from the other ones. Now that's not true for all of the axioms. There are ones that if you get rid of that one, the whole thing falls apart. Or if you get rid of one of them, really bizarre things happen. Um, but this is definitely a question that people care quite a lot about in set theory. Um, and then when you go on to talk about different theories, um, expanding ZF, you really care about what do you absolutely have to assume versus what can you actually derive from other things? So thank you. That was a great question. Okay. So why include these axioms that are provable from other ones in the standard axioms, Bo had asked, or um, no, Travis asked that. Um, I think that because it's, I've actually seen it in different textbooks where sometimes people only literally include the ones that you absolutely need. And then they say, these ones are just consequences, they're not axioms. I think this is more of a style thing. I think this is more of a how do you how do you prefer to think of your theory if you want your entire theory each single axiom to be independent of the set of others um then sure but otherwise um you can just throw some extra ones in there as long as they don't end up contradicting one another maybe for ease of use user friendliness cool okay um, so completeness, which is, I guess, a m much bigger way of stating expressiveness. Theory is complete. I'm going to say T. So T being uh, a set of axioms, or I guess, statements. Theory T is considered complete. If uh, some logic notation, if for all phi, and by phi, I mean sentences constructed with our language, for all sentences, um, 
t proves phi or t proves not phi. So just expanding on this more, um, phi is a consequence of assuming t, of assuming all the axioms of t, phi is eventually something that you can prove versus not phi is a consequence of assuming t. This is super powerful. In fact, so powerful that we don't have it. We, we, we don't have this. It's, it's too powerful. It's, too, it's impossible um, for the math that we use. So we want a theory, we want a collection of axioms to be able to say, look, for any statement, I can either prove it or I can disprove it. Um, so this guy, Godel came along and was like, nope. There will always be a sentence by, again, sentence, such that uh, T, our theory, doesn't really say anything about it. T doesn't prove phi, and T also doesn't prove not phi. So there are always going to be questions, there are always going to be statements in mathematics that we're not going to be able to prove or disprove. We literally won't know if they're true or not. These are the, um, this is one of the incompleteness theorems. So there are specific circumstances under which a theory, a theory is necessarily incomplete. Um, and we will be getting to that, but we are actually almost, we're 12 minutes over our time. And I do wanna talk about the inference rules and a little bit about consistency. Um, so consistency, theory T is consistent. If and only if, which is just the implication both ways. T is consistent if and only if uh, there does not exist a sentence where T proves phi and T proves not phi. So basically a consistent theory I know that there were um, questions about consistency on the Friday lecture, so I want to make sure that I take some time here and be very, very clear. Consistent theories are ones which do not imply contradictions. By contradiction, I mean coming to the conclusion that both A and not A is true. This is not possible. Or you can think about it as um, if you come to the conclusion that zero equals one, if this, if you somehow logically derive these, one of these statements, you have hit a contradiction. So a consistent theory implies no contradictions. It means we're, we're literally not going to prove that true equals false. And you would hope for that too. You would hope that your theory that all of the mathematics that people have created and studied, you would hope to be sure that we're not going to run into a contradiction, that we're not going to find out that the entire castle falls down because somewhere along the way we made a mistake. We also don't have that. We cannot know that we don't prove a contradiction in ZF, in the mathematics that we use. Is anybody, anybody that feels is highly unsettling? Anybody dizzy, nauseous, both? Okay. Um, more on that later. The last thing, inference rules. Um, so I don't know if you guys are familiar with these. It's. Oh, Bo asked a clarifying question. So we can't know or we don't know how? We cannot know. It is literally impossible. Ouch, is their reaction. Okay, so I, I really, I really want to be careful about this. More, more precisely, a theory 
cannot prove its own consistency. This is this is really this is really key here, because I can um, add axioms to a second theory. Let's say uh, here's my first theory t, and I have t prime. T prime prime goes on the other side. T prime and t prime states uh, everything, everything that's in t. All the axioms of t. I'm gonna be much more careful about my notation here. All of the sentences. This little symbol here means in. So all of the sentences in T and so union, um, the mathematical statement, T is consistent. I can I can write that in in logical notation in our language of mathematics. And then I can say that T, oof, that T prime uh, proves. T is consistent. So if you if you want to add things to your axioms that say the smaller theory is consistent, you can, but you you have to assume extra things. Within the scope of the mathematics that we use, we can't prove its own consistency. So there's a well, it thinks that's cheating. It is cheating. It is cheating, Bode. That's actually literally <laughs> how we get around. It's really how logicians fall asleep at night. Is they're like, oh, I'll just, I'll just come up, I'll just come up with a bigger theory that that, that proves uh, that that one's consistent. And if you agree with that, then I can prove, I can make another one that proves that that one's consistent. It's total, it's total BS. It really is. And we have this then this infinite tower of theories that are just proving each other's consistency, which is just like, talk about being up your own ass, man. Does it does it have to be a tower? Like, is there any way to build one theory that proves another and the other proves the one? Or is that oh, for sure. nonsense? Oh, no, 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 no. I mean, I mean, you could, I mean, we could even think about this as like a graph. That, I don't know. I'm I'm just kind of like spitballing here. I have all these different theories and they're all interrelated and some of them, you know, let's make this a directed graph. Some of them prove each other, some of them don't don't prove anything. They're just really bizarre. Um it doesn't necessarily have to mean a tower. I mean the tower, this this kind of, you know, t is contained in t prime is contained in t double prime and so on. Um that's just how people get around it. But of course you could you could make a mm. you could make up whatever theories you want. And you could relate them in any way that you want. Just depends on, you know, if you'd actually find that useful or not. So, but uh, Julia asks if this is used in anything or if it's just theoretical. Um, Julia, is this Julia Millhouse? No. Oh, okay. Because it's about to be like, Julia, you know the answer to this. Uh, but it looks like she left. Um, hmm. So, actually used is a good question. Is this actually used in things? Uh, believe it or not, this is how a lot of, this is literally how a lot of people say, look, we can't, ZF can't prove uh, its own consistency. By the way, this um, con is how you say is consistent. Um, look, we know, we know ZF can't prove itself we can keep adding axioms so that it does get proven. It's not ideal, but um, we'll just accept this for now. We'll just accept this and move on. And there's definitely a study of um, different theories and how they relate to one another. I mean, you know, scratching my itch a little bit here. Um, ZFC is ZF with uh, the axiom of choice. Uh, you could ask the relationship between ZFC and ZF with uh, the negation of the axiom of choice. So the axiom of choice, another axiom, 
we'll talk more about it later. Um, but there's definitely questions about like, okay, how are, how are these two axiomatic systems, how are these two theories related to one another? Does one prove the consistency of the other? Does one prove that the other is inconsistent? Um, turns out, interestingly enough, that these are both exactly as powerful. In terms of the rest of mathematics, these prove the same thing. The same thing. Okay, so we have a few more questions in the queue if there's time. Um, I mean, I have time. Um, I just wanted to say that, you know, we can formally end the lecture here. Um, I usually won't have time to talk afterwards. I only gave myself an hour specifically because my son is usually here and I give him schoolwork and such. Um, but he's not here right now, so I actually do, we, we can continue. Okay, um, Travis asked what I think is a good question to like re-clarify what, um, what the incompleteness theorem is. Um, okay. They ask like, what about a theory with one axiom and no inference rules? Is that not consistent? Um, I mean, sure. The thing is, what are you gonna do with that theory? Like and also, like, it's not about if it's consistent or not. It's about if it can prove its own consistency. Right. So even if you could make a theory with, I mean, I don't know how you'd be able to prove anything without any inference rules, but it, maybe if you had as few inference rules as possible and you had, you know, the theory only has, maybe your theory only uses equality. You don't have any functions or relation. You, the only relation you have is equality. And maybe you don't have any functions or constants. Um, even if you come out somehow could prove the consistency of that theory within itself, what does that, what does that get you? Which is why I think that when I started, I wanted to talk about expressiveness and power because you can make very, very weak theories that maybe are complete or are consistent, but because they're weak, we don't really care about them. I hope that, I hope that clarifies your question. Um, and Bode asked, and I don't know if they mean like specifically T prime being the um, like T union, the assumption that T is consistent. Sure. Um, but they asked, can T prove T prime and T prime prove T at the same time? Um, oh, they said no, like any theory, just two, two different theories, T and T prime. Oh, yeah, absolutely. We, you, you can have. Um... Oh, okay, wait, 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 do you mean? So can two different theories prove each other? Can two theory, well, hold on, can two theories prove each other's consistency? Oh. That's, um, that's a different question. So I'm gonna actually write this out, T prime, question mark, consistency of T. Uh, there's, a, there's a distinct difference here between um, T proving T prime and T prime proving T. And the distinct difference here is uh, consistency of a theory is a statement, a single statement that T proves no contradictions. Proving a theory T is Proving that all sentences in T are true. I hope, I hope that's clear. So we can definitely come back to consistency and completeness. Um, but I do, I, I am a lover of proof theory, ladies and gents. I really am. I do really love proof theory. It's highly unrequited because proof theory does not love me back. Um, but I'm trying so hard to earn its love. So an inference rule, I'm going to use modus ponens. An inference rule is where we have assumptions on top and conclusions on the bottom separated by a line. So this rule, modus ponens, right here, I'm just rewriting it, means that if I assume, if I assume P, 
and I assume that P implies Q. I get Q. I have Q. And that's that's one of the most basic. I mean, that's just that's implication, right? I see the chat popping up with a question. Uh, we're we're good, I think. Um, it was back when we were talking about um, the consistency of T or T prime proving each other, and like if that just meant that they were either both consistent or both inconsistent. But that seems like a rabbit hole we don't have to go down right now. Let's, uh, we can save that for after we talk about inference rules. So inference rules, you can think about these as building blocks for constructing proofs. Oh, Leah asks, um, why don't you need the and notation in the inference rule? Oh, okay. Um, because in the inference rules, um, we assume that just the separation, there's this, this space, between these two um, is that we're assuming everything on top simultaneously. We assume that we have P and that we have P implies Q. And what you're, what you're getting at here, what you're, what you're kind of scratching at is the difference between the meta language and the language. Because we have to be, this is where we have to be careful because P and P implies Q is, is, syntactically different from P and P implies Q. I know, I know that may seem bizarre, but this is a, these are different statements. They may be, they may mean the same thing. Um, but there's a distinction between them. Nicholas agrees that seems bizarre. Um, and Bode had one more um, theory question about, uh, because like we call different fields of mathematics theory, uh, number theory, graph theory, group theory. Is that related to um, like what we're, the theories we're talking about in logic? Um, no, in a very similar way that um, the, um, like the theory of evolution, like we wouldn't call that a, like a mathematical theory. We wouldn't call that a theory, like a, like a collection of axioms. This is the, um, this is very similar to the question about why is it called predicate calculus? And it's not actually calculus. It's um, the same words being used in different ways. Unfortunately, not all mathematicians are logicians. Unfortunately, logicians don't rule all of mathematics. Um, they just rule logic. So unfortunately, there's a, there's a little bit of, um, wires getting crossed. So number theory is just the study. I don't want to say the study of numbers because that makes it sound really simple when in fact it's like terrifyingly complicated. <laughs> I'm like very allergic to number theory. Um, no, it's, it's not, they're not, they're not, I mean, I guess you could philosophically think of them as similar, but no, number theory is not literally a list of axioms. Um, it's just the study of something like scientific theory. Okay. So our inference rules, we have uh, assumptions on top. Um, when I say these are different statements, I mean really syntactically. This is just a style thing. Um, when you're talking about different, um, there's a lot of different ways of presenting inference rules. There's a lot of different, um, again, I mentioned uh, proof calculi. Um, and some of them include that the, when you stay, there's like a different one. When you have assumptions on top, there's an implied and in between all of the statements. And then on the bottom, there is an implied um, or. So this is this is a, a style difference more than anything else. So in terms of just you know introducing inference rules, we have assumptions on top, conclusions on bottom, and and listen. I know that when you see if you've ever seen a proof, if you've ever read through a proof. 
I mean, if you if you think about the square root of two, the proof that square root of two is no irrational number, um, you don't you don't see you don't see these rules, right? If somebody says um, p implies p or q, that's not you don't see mathematicians using these things. This is because these inference rules um, are kind of it's just formally writing down the tactics with which we use to prove things. So this again comes into the subject of proof theory, which is studying proofs, their structure, how they differ, um, what kind of inference rules you assume, how the assumptions that you make change the proofs, the different kinds of conclusions your theories can come to. Um, I think that there are plenty of different logic courses where you may not even end up talking about inference rules. Um, but again, I'm a lover of proof theory. Um, and inference rules are actually really, I mean, I really hope none of my professors ever see this, but inference rules are a pain in the ass. I mean, if I said, uh, if I tried to come up with an example, let's say I wanted to prove, uh, P or Q and P and R. I'm sorry, P or Q and P and R, P or R, that's right. Um, and I'm gonna say, okay, I have to work from the bottom up. If I'm going to write this literally as like using inference rules, um, I'm gonna have the definition of and in here. So in order to come to the conclusion with an and statement in it, I have to separately have P or Q and P or R. And then from each of these ones, I'm going to have to use another inference rule to assume those. Now I have to assume, I have to at some point assume something at the top. But you can see now how I've gotten from, if I just assume P, I've now given you a derivation. I mean, it's a really kind of silly one almost. I've given you a derivation of this statement using the inference rules. I used one here and I used the same one here and here. So it, it gets very, very complex if you want to prove different statements, especially when you start adding to inference rules statements such as, um, Let's use, okay, let's use the example someone came up with. Uh, universal quantification implies existential. Universal quantification implies existential. Except in the case of the empty set. Um, let's say for all x, um, phi of x, y is true. Y is some, some other parameter we don't really care about right now. Um, I'm going to use this to say that there exists x such that phi of x, y. Wow, it's terrible. My handwriting is really terrible. You're doing great. Thanks, Gene. Gassing me up over here. Um, here's an inference rule. I'm just going to include on the side here. Um, never mind. Let's just assume we're not working in the case of the set here. Um, here's an inference rule. It's not any of these that I included up here because for introducing inference rules, I only wanted to show you ones, um, the proposition, the ones using propositional calculus because when you throw in predicate calculus into it, you have even so many more inference rules that can interact with one another. And a lot of what um, you're expected to know in proof theory is they'll give you a statement and you'll be expected to derive it using um, a certain collection of inference rules. Um, and it gets real annoying real fast. Um, I mostly wanted to show you the inference rules uh, to illustrate that there, we, we can consider proofs as mathematical objects. We can define the way that we prove things syntactically very carefully 
Um, you may not end up seeing these or using these ever. Most mathematicians don't, I think. Um, but proof theory is itself its own subject. Okay. Um, Bode asks if we can use logical equivalency, uh, like re reducing one um, statement to the other. But I, I think that's the whole point of these uh, yeah. difference rules. That's kind of the is to like figure out what is logically equivalent. Yeah, what what logically follows from a list of assumptions. Um, I think that yeah, you can use logical equivalency, but it would maybe be. Um, oh, and now Bode asks, can't we just use truth tables? Um. You can, I think part of the problem is that truth tables take up uh, a lot of space and a lot of time to actually fill out. Believe it or not, uh, we actually do care about how long proofs take to compute. Um, and there are ways where we can use existential quantification and universal quantification in order to shorten things. Oops. Um, and again, because we can't just use propositional calculus if we want to talk about all mathematics, we do need um, functions and relations. So uh, unfortunately for functions, especially functions over infinite sets, you can't use a truth table because you can't write an infinite truth table um, in order to say, exactly, I mean, if you want to assume the axiom of choice and do some kind of, you know, Zorin's lemonade, I don't know. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I missed a question a while ago. Someone asked, asked what the axiom of choice was. Don't, don't. That's what I said was don't get her started. Did you literally say that in the chat? I literally said that in the chat, sweetie. Oh my God, okay. Okay, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna call it here. Um, I do have to call somebody, I was supposed to call them seven minutes ago. But this, I hope, um, was sufficiently dizzying but somewhat illuminating some of the i love this sandwich picture it's such a good illustration of how terrible the english language is <laughs> um, and i really like how much bigger my handwriting got throughout the whole scope of the throughout the whole scope of the talk um i'm gonna call it here thank you guys so much for coming i mean feel free to continue to ask questions um in the Discord, obviously, and uh, I'll post this video. I have been recording. I'll post this video um, to YouTube so that the Friday people can see it if they'd like, or if anybody missed it, they could catch it. Uh, and we'll we'll talk more about all this on Wednesday. Cool. Um, is there a schedule for these meetings? Two thirty to three thirty PDT. Cool. All right. Thank you guys. Enjoy the rest of your Monday.